So uh, my name is Sarah Gallagher and I'm a senior meteorologist in Mount Erin and I'm head of the observations division. Um, so in terms of, of what I'm going to talk about, um, the first part will be all about Mount Erin, who we are, what we do, how we do it. Um, and then there'll be a little bit at the end about my story, my career path and how I ended up in Mount Erin and how I ended up as the head of observations. Um, Okay, so just a little bit about Matt Aaron. Um, it started with observations. So the first real time weather observation was transmitted from Valencia Island in County Kerry in 1860 um, under the auspicious of the British Meteorological Service. And they continued to run meteorological matters in Ireland until 1936 when the Irish Meteorological Service or Met Aaron was established. And our mission is to monitor, analyze and predict Ireland's weather and climate uh, information for the public, for our customers and for society at large. And our vision um, as part of our strategic goals is making Ireland weather and climate prepared. So on the right there, we just have a group picture from last year, from actually earlier this year. Um, I'm somewhere in among the crowd there. Luckily, I'm short enough to only have the top of my head. Um, but that's with the, um, the Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization in the middle there who came to visit us um, before COVID locked everything down. And then in the bottom right, um, there's just a, an image of Valencia Observatory in County Kerry where the first uh, were beside where the first um, weather observation was sent from back in 1860. So what do we do? Well, in Met Erin, we take part in <clears throat> observations and climate monitoring. So we have the Surface Observing Network. Um, on the right, you'll see a, a map of Ireland. And we have synoptic stations, which would be our main stations um, that transmit hourly data around the world. We have um, camp or climate monitoring stations there in orange, and then we have a lot of manual stations there in blue. So uh, our Ireland or Med Erin has a long history of working with the community, and we have uh, hundreds of voluntary observers who actually send in daily readings to us as part of our voluntary observing network. Um, but in recent years, we have been automating uh, some of those stations and putting in automatic weather stations, which will provide us with high precision, real time data. And um, you can see an image there of a wave boy. We also, um, in collaboration with the Marine Institute, um, we um, manage the MBOYS or the Ar Irish Marine Weather Boy Network. And um, we also have two weather radars in the country at Dublin and Shannon. And um, we also um, gather satellite information um, for weather forecasting purposes and for climate, climatological purposes. Um, and we also partake in atmospheric chemistry programs or environmental monitoring programs. And um, so that is where we're looking at air pollution and air quality and also greenhouse gas emissions. And um, so just some images there of some of the work that we do um, underneath here. Can you see my cursor when I do that? Yeah, so that's just an example of one of our um, surface network stations. And we have the Stevenson screen there where you would have the thermometers and the humidity sensors. This is a salometer and that actually measures the height, the base height of the clouds. And uh, in this um, enclosure here, it's actually a tipping bucket rain gauge that measuring the rain. Um, so this this instrument here is actually familiar to me. It's it's called a Dines and Emo. So it's actually this is actually a, a wind measurement. So this is the speed, and this is the direction part. And this would have been in many of our stations um, for for a long long period of time. And um, of course now it's all digital, and we use we have cup and vein, uh, cup and vein anemometers. But in the old days, you used to have to get your slide ruler out and calculate um, a minute wind speed, maximum gusts um, every day based on what was printed on these, um, these 
charts. And there uh, on the bottom um, right, just one of the team up a mast changing the new, the more modern um, wind measurement instrumentation that we have. Just in terms of um, Valencia Observatory. So Valencia Observatory it, it achieved WMO's Centennial Observing Station status um, for recording over 100 years of high quality continuous meteorological measurements. And here we have the President Michael D releasing um, a radio sound balloon up into the air um, as part of celebrations uh, for that designation or accreditation by the WMO. Um, so in Valencia Observatory, um, we have uh, a geophysical and a meteorological program. Um, and uh, so on the geophysical side, you know, we have a long-standing geomagnetics program, seismology, lyrics. Um, on me the meteorological side, we have the pollution monitoring, Technology. So that's um, looking at bud growth um, and using that as an indication for climate change. So when um, leaves bud on very specific trees. And um, we also have, um, we collect from aircraft, we release the radio sounds. We also have LIDAR for upper air and um, for looking at the upper air and um, aerosol monitoring, lightning detection. Um, the ground uh, surface synoptic network, solar radiation monitoring, and also ozone monitoring. So there's a lot that actually goes down, goes on in Valencia Observatory, um, and it's it's a very varied and interesting place to uh, to work. So uh, the main role or the main thing that Medairn is is famous for or is involved in is is weather forecasting. And um, so, how do you predict the future? Um, well, the atmosphere is a physical system. Um, and its movement is governed by the laws of physics. And these can be expressed using mathematical equations. So um, the equations that are used are the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, Stokes, uh, of course, was famously born in Sligo. So there's an Irish connection. And um, so What's generally solved in weather models is the continuity equation, the momentum equation, uh, the conservation of energy or the thermodynamic equation and the ideal gas law. And so first thing we need to do is we use observations to get an idea of what the weather is like now. So the global observation system, we have the surface um, the radio sounds that I mentioned, there's radar, there's satellite products, there's aircraft data. And we use this to build up a picture of what the weather is like now. It's not perfect, but we do, we um, make our best guess of what the atmosphere uh, is doing at a particular moment in time. And then we use the equations to calculate how the weather will change over time, i.e. tomorrow. So we have initial conditions, um, they go into a weather model and out, outcome forecasts. Um, how are these calculated? Well, um, they're calculated on uh, numerical grids with a vertical and horizontal resolution. Um, these model physical processes um, and it's carried out uh, computationally on a supercomputer and out of that then you will get your forecast or your weather model or whatever it is that you're running. So as I said, they, numerical weather modeling exploits high performance computing architectures and it's parallel computing. And um, so there's many calculations are happening simultaneously in order to produce a weather forecast. Um, we also participate in a global endeavor as weather doesn't recognize borders. So um, through the ECMWF, we have access to um, uh, highly advanced global weather forecast and ensemble products. And we use those um, in our forecasts and also to drive our regional or local models for specific uses. Um, something else just to mention is that predictability depends on the scale of motion in the atmosphere. So when you're looking at large scales, so the jet stream or Osby waves, you can look 
or predict these with some skill weeks in advance. When you start looking at synoptic scales, so that's the size of a, a depression or a storm in the Atlantic or a weather system, as we would call it, um, you know, we can start looking at predicting these with accuracy forward the order of a few days or a week. When we start looking at um, mesoscale or small scale um, uh, weather or meteorological motions, then you're talking at, at predicted at one hour or sub hour time scales. So when you are uh, designing your grid, you have to take into account the, the predictability and that depends on the, the the scale of motion and then also the grid size. So the spatial extent, how you're parameterizing or are you actually solving a particular um, atmospheric uh, parameter? So how do we deal with this chaos and predictability issues um, in forecasting? Well, we tend to use an ensemble prediction system. So we have an initial set of conditions and these get moved forward in time. And then at the other side, it, you know, these are um, the uncertainty is modeled either through a slight change in the physics or the initial conditions of each of these models, each of these states. And then the result is a range of future possible weather scenarios. And we can use that to look at the likelihood um, that a particular um, forecast will happen or not. And we can use that then to forecast the weather and to also um, give the public or um, or any other stakeholders um, an idea of the uncertainty um, in the weather forecast. So we run an ensemble prediction system called IREPS in internally in MedAaron and it's a regional model. It's the Harmony Arome model and it's driven by ECMWF um, at the boundary, boundary conditions. And we have currently 11 members and um, so it has a two and a half kilometer resolution. It runs for 54 hours and um, four times a day. And it produces a lot of data, hundreds of gigs per run um, and hundreds of terabytes per year. And then, so why is this necessary? Well, um, our uh, MedAaron's remit is really protecting life and property and um, creating societal good. So for example, when there is a, an extreme weather event and um, the National Director for Fire and Emergency Management might be called and we would be called in to perhaps give a weather briefing. So for flooding or for a storm, um, you know, and we can give information on the impacts, high impact weather um, and also issue weather warnings. If you look at the picture on the right, we have there Evelyn Cusack, sorry, on the left, our head of forecasting. And you may, some of you may recognize her from when she was, was on the TV, but she's now um, the head of forecasting. So she, she does a lot of media work, but she wouldn't be on the nine or six o'clock news anymore. And um, just uh, on the right there, there is the rainfall forecast that I just took a snapshot of 6 p.m. today. Um, that was just taken out from the, from the website. So you can see it's showing some showers in the vicinity, but a generally dry night with some scattered showers. So I don't know if that, I hope that came through. I think it was pretty dry, a bit of showery rain passing through the day. Um, so also, yeah, why is this important? Well, for example, Ophelia back in, um, a few years ago, back in 2017, you see um, the satellite um, image on the left, and then you have the model um, image on the right, and they coincided pretty well. Um, so it was a well-predicted event, and um, obviously the, the whole country was in a red weather warning. It's just from several days out and then from the night before, predicting the track of the X hurricane. Um, and on the far right here, you see the, um, the passing of the center of the storm uh, through Valencia Observatory um, at around 11 a.m. on the 18th. Yeah, eight, oh, yeah, on the 18th of October. 
no, the 16th of October, sorry, 2017. I was like, no, it's the 16th. And then you see here down at the bottom, there is the mean wind speed in red and the gusts in green. So the mean wind speed was reaching, you know, between 55 and 60. 364 knots, which would be hurricane speed, and you have gusts then well in excess of that. And um, so it was a violent storm. And um, by the time it reached us, it was no longer, it no longer had hurricane status. But what was unusual about Ophelia was that it had the tropical hurricane characteristics, which meant that you get very severe gusts and you could get severe damage, even though it was no longer um, it was now a, a a depression rather than a, a tropical storm. Uh, another aspect of the work we do in Med Erin is climate change forcing, uh, climate change forecasting. So um, we are involved in global climate modeling through the EC Earth Consortium, um, and we um, partner with ICHEC to run the EC Earth model for the CMEP5 project, and we're currently um, contributing to the CMIP-6 and the IPCC AR-6 and also downscaling um, those global um, climate projections to a regional scale. Um, so how did I end up working in Med Erin? Well, um, in school I was always interested in geography, physics and chemistry and I did all of them for the Leaving Cert. So my career guidance counsellor recommended I do engineering as something kind of general to, to do. So I, I got the points and I went to Trinity to do engineering. Um, and then I specialised in electronic and electrical engineering, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to be an engineer. And I definitely don't remember a huge amount of, of the maths that I learned there. But I, I think it provided me with a very good grounding in science, physics, in applied maths. and um, also in logically thinking through problems and solving problems in that way and being very practical and you know um so i did a bit of traveling after that but then when i came back to ireland there was an advertisement i remember i saw it in the paper looking for meteorological officers for met erin um they wanted people specifically who had electronics or instrumentation or and um, software engineering backgrounds. And when I read the job description, I'm trying to recall what it said, but it, what ca captured my um, my eye was you could be you could be asked to work anywhere in the country and um, involved a lot of field work. And um, this just seemed really exciting to me. So I joined uh, Med Erin in 2006 as a meteorological officer. I did my training and I was placed down in Rossler Harbour. So in the very southeast of the country in an outstation and um, where you work 24 7 shifts it's I can it's kind of like being assigned to a lighthouse I think that's the only way I can describe the experience but it was it was it was it was a pretty useful um kind of uh look into um you know how things manual um observations were carried out in the past and this station still had a and um, anemometer, everything was done by hand. Um, but I really, you know, at the time, I really wanted to get back into uh, to Dublin. Um, so a uh, vacancy came in the instrumentation and environmental monitoring division, and I was transferred to instrumentation with my background in engineering. And then I spent the next few years going around the country automating or installing automatic weather stations uh, in place of these manual stations where people had been going out and measuring, taking the thermometer temperature, taking uh, the wind temperature and sending them off um, every hour on the hour 24 seven for the previous number of decades. So this is just a picture of me in a very muddy day in the middle of Ireland installing one of these stations. And then this is just a, a logger box where we basically have the power and comms and, um, supply all the different instrumentations in an installation and um, so they were a lot of fun but also a lot of hard work a lot of early mornings and late nights and um, and I knew at the time that I really really wanted to go back to college and I wanted to go back go more into the science side of things so um, I decided to return to education 
and I was able to get a career break from Med Erin. And I went and did um, a, a master's in meteorology in UCD um, under Peter Lynch. Um, and I really loved being back in education. And I also discovered that the mathematics that have been sometimes a bit of a mystery to me in my undergraduate in engineering, it all made sense now that I was applying it to the weather. Um, and so I really wanted to stay on. So I um, applied for a PhD program uh, straight after my meteorological master's was finished. And I joined the UCD Wave Group uh, under Professor uh, Frederick Diaz. And I studied for a PhD in applied and computational math mathematics. And my area was looking at wind wave modeling. So numerical modeling of um, wind waves or ocean surface waves and their effects, um, their effect on the coastline, also how they might change in the future, what the climatology was, and then maybe perhaps um, how um, the potential for, re for renewable energy extraction, specifically around the coast of Ireland and the Northeast Atlantic. So that was a really great time. And I really loved um, being in UCD and back in college, but the career beckoned and um, there was an opportunity to go back to Met Erin, but in a different role as a research meteorologist. Up until this point, I'd been a technical uh, meteorological officer, they're called, or so um, I'd been more the tech technical specialist side, and I decided that it would be great to go into the research and the R&D and the science side of things. So I joined the research, the research division in Met Erin, and I was in charge of already for remote sensing applications. And um, I managed part the, the r and side of the weather radar and um, satellite now casting. I did a little bit of work in numerical weather prediction, climate services, and then also developing systems for data pre-processing of observations before they were they are assimilated into numerical weather prediction uh, models. So um, in, web, in meteorology, um, observations data is sent all around the world freely for everyone to use. And this, this includes a huge amount of satellite, aircraft, um, and other types of observations. But all of this data has to be processed, thinned, and put into a format where a numerical weather prediction model can take it in and produce a forecast. So I was working on that for quite a while um, before I got the job I really wanted at the time, which was the head of the marine unit. It's another meteorolo meteorologist role in Med Erin, but um, it was more specific to the PhD that I had just done and the research that I was doing um, on the side anyway. So um, I took over the marine unit um, and worked on observational and modeling roles in uh, marine meteorology. Um, including the development of coastal flow forecasting strategy and plans, coordinating research projects. Um, I, research, I supervised a couple of research fellows and um, I co-supervised a PhD student in the wave group with Frederick Diaz um, and also then was continuously trying to publish or attend conferences and wave modeling wave climate and um, looking at wind wave extremes and wave extremes and then ocean renewable energy. So on the uh, right there, there's actually an image of I took of at uh, Mullock Moor, not, not as impressive as the ones last week, but um, that was in 2016. There was a storm that came to Mullock Moor and I drove up and that's a uh, and surfer um, surfing that wave. Um, and on the bottom here, just looking at climate projections for wave, uh, for significant wave height for Ireland, uh, for the 95th percentile of significant wave height, just looking at the decrease and increase in um, mean wave, mean, well, in 95th percentile, it's very significant wave heights um, at the end of the century. So it was just some of the, the kind of research that I was doing in my role. Um, and then this year, um, I moved again to become uh, head of a division in Med Erin. So using my previous experience 
in instrumentation. And then a lot of the work that I was doing when I was in research, um, I was able to uh, get the job as head of observations. So um, this is the structure of Met Air and at senior management level. So you have uh, infrastructure, so IT and OBS, you have the services, so flood forecasting, and uh, general forecasting or weather forecasting. And then also we have aviation forecasting or aviation services. And then we have our research side, and then we also have some um, governance uh, activities there. So what does the observations division do? It's responsible for um, the National Meteorological Infrastructure of Ireland. It's a pretty large division for Met Erin. Met Erin has a, approximately 200 staff um, and about 40 of those are in the observations division. It's very dispersed. So we have Valencia Observatory. There's also staff in Belmullet. We do a lot of work at the five airports around the country. And then of course you saw the map of all the surface observing stations. They have to be visited um, at least once a year as some are calibrated twice a year, for example, the airports. So there's constantly people moving and working at different parts, places around the country. Um, and also, um, the division requires diverse expertise in STEM. So if that, that makes sense. So everything from technicians, instrumentation, software engineers through to, um, you know, physicists, uh, we have a, a lab. So you need, so we need people with experience in atmospheric chemistry, um, as well as numerical modeling, as well as mathematics, applied mathematics. So, um, there's lots of different um, different areas um, that are required to make a MET service work and uh, operate effectively. Um, so in terms of the core work um, in observations, we manage the ground weather stations in MET Erin, the radars, the satellite reception systems, and all of the climate stations, which need to be maintained, um, calibrated, repaired, and um, we also maintain a database, which is called the, the National Climate Archive, which contains all of the historical records for Med Erin. Um, we also provide um, a, a wide range of quality assured or quality controls. So um, when the data comes in, it is checked for um, accuracy, consistency. It goes through a, a rigorous process before it is uh, deemed to be quality controlled and then that's what we might call our best guess um, or our most accurate um, observation for that particular place at that particular time. Um, we all, um, also responsible for the meteorological and environmental programs conducted at Valencia Observatory in County Kerry. Um, so why would you uh, join Med Erin? Well, there's lots of opportunities for STEM graduates um, at environmental science, sciences, so physics, chemistry, um, applied and computational mathematics, engineering, software development, high performance computing, instrumentation, GIS, remote sensing. And we also regularly have research fellowship campaigns. And um, that is a recent development, but we, we take on a few research fellowships for specific projects every year. And we hope to continue that. Um, we also, um, this, I'm just gonna plug, uh, this is me. This is our trad band in uh, Met Erin called Kyo. Uh, and we, before pre-lockdown, we used to go around and play at any weather events we could. Um, here is just three of my colleagues from Instruments back when I was there on top of a the mast. They're doing some work installing some instrumentation and um, just hanging out. So there's lots of very diverse work. And then we also have um, our meteorologists who present, um, forecasters, sorry, who present on RTE at the six and nine o'clock news. So this is just a nice image of a, a weather station on the west coast at Mace Head. So it's beautiful scenery. Um, this is uh, just an example of um, our ensemble um, system we have internally that we can see what the likelihood of, of, of weather is. That's just an example. That's our domain, our forecasting domain. And I'm gonna leave you with a picture of a sunset at Mace Head at one of our automatic stations. And these are two, two rain gauges just sitting there on a rock. 
Um, and thank you for listening and thank you for your time. And um, I'll take any questions now. <laughs>